How did a jar of water shock anyone? Well, I'll tell you, and along the way, I'll talk about shocking people for the king's pleasure, breaking all the rules, and a bunch of masochistic adrenaline junkies with some really difficult names to pronounce. Ready? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. This story begins on October 11th, 1745. On that day, a German man named Ewald Georg von Kleist gave himself a pretty good shock. Kleist had read about a modern wizard named Matthias Boza, who had electrified himself with an electrical machine and then used a spark from his finger to light alcohol on fire. Now, Kleist didn't really know how Boza did it, so he just connected the alcohol directly to the electrical machine. He took a glass jar full of alcohol and put a cork in it. He then put a nail through the cork into the alcohol and held it up to his electric generator. For a long time, not much happened. Then Kleist touched the nail with his free hand and was Ow! thrown across the room. Kleist wrote to several friends about his traumatic experience, and they were eager to copy it. People at the time were a bit of masochistic adrenaline junkies, as you will see. However, even though Kleist reported that he held the jar in his bare hands, his friends thought that was reflective of his lack of electrical knowledge. Instead, they repeated the experiment with the glass jar on a wax stand and reported that it did not work. Unfortunately for Kleist's friends and for Kleist, the bare hand is an important part of how the bottle stores energy. See, at the time, they knew if you tried to electrify conductive material on the ground, the electricity would just flow into the ground. Therefore, they knew they had to put the alcohol on an insulator, a glass or wax or something like that. What they didn't know was if the insulator was thin, like the thin glass jar, and had a conductor on the other side, it could store an incredible amount of energy. See, when they rubbed the glass sphere on the electric machine, it collected electrons. The electrons then flowed into the liquid in the bottle. The electrons would then stop at the inner surface of the jar as the glass is an insulator and does not let electrons move easily. However, electricity works at a distance. So if someone is holding the glass with bare hands, then some electrons in the person's hands flow away from the jar and into the person and eventually the ground. This leaves the outside of the jar with a positive charge, which causes more electrons to collect on the inner surface of the jar, which causes even more electrons to flow from the outside of the jar and through the person. This continues until it reaches its maximum charge capacity, which is why it is sometimes called a capacitor, with equal and opposite charges on both sides. Once someone like poor Kleist touches both surfaces, the electrons on the inner surface would race through him all at once, giving him that terrible shock. One of the strange features of this jar is you can store charge for future use. You charge it up with an electrical machine or even a modern battery, and then you can move it safely by just touching only the bottom part or only the nail. Once you connect the two, awesome. then you can get a big shock or a spark. Of course, at the time, no one knew any of this, so all attempts to recreate the shock were fruitless. As Kleist wasn't famous in any way, it looked like nothing much would come of this discovery. Luckily, another amateur named Andreas Cuneus joined the story. Cuneus either heard about Kleist experiments or came up with something strikingly similar on his own. Either way, he had the same setup, but with water instead of alcohol in the jar. Cuneus got a shock from his jar of water just like Kleist got from his jar of alcohol. However, Cuneus had a famous friend. Pieter van Muschenbroek was a physics professor in the town of Leiden, Germany. Muschenbroek repeated Cuneus and Kleist's experiment, and like the men before him, he too got a terrible shock. He wrote to a Parisian friend about the terrible experiment, which he advised his friend never to attempt. He said he would never do it again for all the kingdom in France. And in fact, he only survived by the grace of God. A French clergyman and scientist named Jean-Antoine Nollet read the letter and was intrigued, remember masochist, and quickly repeated the experiment, whereby it, quote, bent him double and knocked out his wind. Nollet described the experiment to the Paris Academy and soon everyone was basically torturing themselves with these jars. He began selling them as Leyden jars, as 
Muchenbrach was from the town of Leiden, Germany, and presumably Muchenbach jars were too difficult to say. One of the favorite activities with the Leiden jar was electrocuting large groups of people at a time. Nolet entertained the King of France, Louis XV, by electrocuting 180 soldiers at one time, over 200 monks wearing their robes, and over 600 people at the College of Navarre. Nolet noted that, quote, it's singular to see the multitude of different gestures and to hear the instantaneous exclamation of those surprised by the shock. In theory, these experiments inform people how circuits work in a circle and how fast, very, but mostly it was just used for strange entertainment. In 1767, a dour looking English scientist described the effect of the Leyden jar thusly, quote, everyone was eager to see, and notwithstanding the terrible count that was reported of it, to feel the experiment. And in the same year as which it was discovered, numbers of persons in almost every country in Europe got a livelihood by going about and showing it. Leyden jars were not only insanely popular for demonstrations in the 1700s, they're still important for technology today. See, if you want to get a big shock like with a defibrillator, then you connect a battery to a modern Leyden jar called a capacitor. Then you connect the capacitor straight to the patient's heart and you get a big shock. If conversely, you have a portable system that you want to protect from jolts of electricity, like you do for all modern electronics, then you add a capacitor to absorb that spike in energy. Finally, if a charged capacitor is connected to a coil, it can create oscillating signals, which is important for radio and even television and computers and cell phones. Don't worry, I'll get to that in later videos. In the 1700s, one of the things that was most intriguing about these jars, aside from their awesome power, is they seemed to violate everything they understood about electricity. Why did it store more charge if you let the electricity on the outside flow away from the jar? Scientists at the time just couldn't figure it out. As Muchenbrach said at the end of his first letter about the discovery of the jar, quote, I found out so much about electricity that I've reached a point where I understand nothing and can explain nothing. The Leyden jar was the key to unlock the mysteries of electricity. Strangely enough, the person who figured it out the man who instinctively understood about electricity didn't live in France or Germany or England or anywhere else a scientist from Europe would expect. Instead, he lived in Philadelphia. How Benjamin Franklin discovered electricity is next time on The Secret History of Electricity. Electricity, 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 electricity. Thanks for watching my video. Please remember to give it a big thumbs up. It always makes me happy. Have a good day.